There can be only one podcast, and may it be the princess of the universe. Hi, folks, I'm Matt, and I am going through the actual Highlander books. That's right, going through them all. In fact, I did two comic book series that if you missed, you need to go back and watch it. I really don't talk about much about them. <laughs> In fact, I think, what, two-thirds? Two-thirds of that, uh, almost two-thirds, I think, of that whole conversation was me setting it up. Because I knew I hated both of those comic book series and couldn't talk much about them. Now, the movie novelization, I'll give a little bit of build up for, but I think I can talk about this one a little bit longer. Uh, let me talk about first, I do want to mention just for a little while, the movie. Now, Bruce and I have talked about the movie. We've talked about how much we enjoyed it. Um, I think the Kurgan's a great character. I think he's a great villain. Honestly, one of the best villains Hollywood created. Um, uh, I could probably put him in my top 10. I don't know if he'd be in the top five, but he could definitely be in the top ten. Kurgan's just a great character, and Kurgan could be in the top five. I don't know. I never thought about it that way. I mean, I really have to dig deep into all my movie knowledge, but Kurgan's just a great villain. You love to hate him. You love to hate him. He's just fantastic, and he's scary. You don't know what's going to happen because he towers over Connor McCloud. It just, I can't remember the name of the actor right now, but he did a fantastic job. Whenever I see him, like every once in a while, I'll catch him. He's much older now. He's got white hair. He plays the Grim Commander or something like that. And every time I see him, I'm like, oh, Kurgan. You know, that's that's just who he is to me. And I think that's, I think that's his most popular role even today. Uh, he just can't get over that, which, hey, that's a great thing to do, right? And the Kurgan's such an evil character, so good. And it took place back in, you know, back in the mid-80s. Um, classic. It's still, the movie itself still holds up, in my opinion. I think it's really well done. The sound is a little off at times, feels kind of hollow, recorded, and stuff. Um, but I, overall, I think it was interesting. I can see why this was a big movie when it came out back in the day. Now, I found out about Highlander through the TV series because my mom was watching it at the time. And when, uh, I was watching. I didn't really understand because I know they're flipping back and forth in time, but I didn't know how it was happening. I didn't know it was, you know, uh, flashbacks. I th at the time, I think at the same time, Highlander three had come out. I think it was 1993, and I knew Highlander three was out. And I thought the movie was connected to the TV show. I thought the TV show was, and and then when Highlander three came out, it said the final dimension. I went, oh, okay, so these guys are traveling dimensions. They're time travelers, is what I thought. I said, oh, and they fight through time. That's why you see the same people fighting in the 1700s. Then you see them now in the 1990-something, 1990s, and they're still fighting. I was like, oh, okay, so they fight. They jump. It is the current day, but they fight, and then they jump through time and fight in these different eras. I went, eh, that's kind of neat. <laughs> yeah, that is kind of a neat idea for a story when you think about it. But that was not what Highlander was about. Um, I just read the title to Highlander 3 and saw bits and clips of what my mom was watching. And then eventually, I don't remember how, but I, I think Bruce did get me into watching it. And, I, and he made me go back and watch the uh, movies. And I remember watching the movies, each one for the first time. And I'll just talk about the first three movies, I guess. But the first one, I absolutely loved. I thought it was really good. I, it was weird seeing Sean Connery in that role because I have no idea he that he did that. And it was weird seeing him trying to play a Spaniard too, even though we turn we, turns out later he's Egyptian, um, which makes a little bit more sense ba based on Sean Connery's uh, complexion. But I enjoyed it. I was ready for the second one. Didn't know what the second one was going to be about because I still didn't know much about this Highlander series. Br Bruce, I think, had made me watch all three movies before I watched the TV show. And the second one, I was just totally confused. Like, what? He went, it's just a different retelling, dude, but it's kind of cool, right? I was like, no, this is stupid. And three, I thought, was pretty decent. Um, Mario Van Peebles did a good job as the villain. Um, there's just one scene, and I absolutely hate. I know we covered this when we reviewed the movies years ago, but I hate the scene where they're fighting on holy ground, and it's Duncan, uh, not Duncan, Connor's sword that shatters, even though he's not the one who started the fight. I thought, I thought that whoever started the fight, something bad should happen to him, but nothing bad happened to him. It happened to the defender, and then he left when he saw whatever Buddha was appearing, you know, or ruffling the whatever temple they were fighting in. He was like, "Oh, I gotta get out of here," and that was never explained. Plus, I hated that. I thought there should have been deeper ramifications for fighting on holy ground. I was all, I was all up for seeing what would happen when you threw down on holy ground. I think that's still a cool rule. We don't fight on holy ground, and everyone, even the most evil person, like the Kurgan, you know, 
will acknowledge that rule. And so here's Mario Van Peebles, and he has to be bigger and badder, so he does fight on holy ground. But then he doesn't suffer any consequence. Connor does. That that always rubbed me the wrong way. I think you change that, and you change a little bit of the magic. because there's, there's magic in it, of course. But if you change a little bit of all that up, I think you have a pretty solid film and a pretty good uh, sequel following at least the one that makes sense for the original movie. Now, of course, Highlander 3 does not follow along with the TV show e- either. It takes place in the cinematic universe. Um, also, something you'll never hear me talk about is the cartoon series. Yes, I did watch Quentin uh, McCloud, and it, oh, it's awful. It's awful. The cartoon series is a what were they thinking? You know, who got drunk and thought this was a good idea? That's what the cartoon series is. I've only watched it once. I will never, ever, ever watch that garbage again. I can hear Bruce laughing right now if he's listening to the podcast. I think Bruce, I may be wrong on this, but I think Bruce has the entire collection still today. Maybe on VHS, but I remember he's the one that had it and had me watch it. I don't know. Maybe it's on DVD. Ugh, is that monstrosity on DVD? Ugh, I hope not. I hope not. But, um... Anyway, the movies as a whole, the first one is still the best one. It's just really great. A lot of good characters. Of course, there's some things I felt like, man, I really wish they'd explain that more. Well, enter the novel, which from my understanding, this novel never came out in the U.S. It was only released in the uh, in Europe. Uh, and I was like, shut up. And it's, it's not too expensive to get. It didn't cost me. It is the most expensive book I paid for, but it didn't cost me that much. At the same time, either I got it relatively cheap. I think this was the seven dollar book. I got. I can't imagine paying more than that. Uh, shipping took a long time. It took forever to get to me. Of course, I was waiting to get all this other stuff in as well at the same time, so I wasn't really worried about it. When it finally came in, cover looks really neat. It's the cover from the uh, one of the posters of the movie, and like I said, I'd heard good things about it. Now, Bruce had told me a long time ago, and he uh, maybe he he got mad. He's like, "Well, I told you that too." And I just don't remember, but Bruce had actually read the novelization. He said, dude, you need to read this because it has a lot of stuff that's not in the movie. And I I don't, if he told me that, I don't know why I didn't read it then. Because if someone would have told me that, I would have definitely read it. Because I was in it. I love Highlander, and I want to hear more. And I thought the movie didn't explain a few things. And if I would have known what this book explained, I would have definitely bought it. So I don't know. I mean, Bruce may have thought of someone else when he was saying that, but he he swears up and down it was me. But I just don't know if he told me that why I didn't read it. Maybe I asked for it and he was going to let me borrow it later, and he didn't. He lost it. I don't know. But usually, something like that. When I hear something like that, I was like, I'd be all over it. Um, like I said, when I was on this, I told I said this last week. But when I was, when I was on the another uh, uh, YouTube channel, they had mentioned it to me that it had a lot of scenes. A lot of stuff that wasn't in the movie that explains the characters and the background and certain story plots, points. And I was like, oh, I was genuinely interested. I think right either during the YouTube stream or right after, I bought it. I bought the book. I didn't hesitate because that's something I really like. I really like Highlander. And that's when I started looking into everything Highlander and noticed that, oh, this all connects. Well, by gum, I'll go ahead and get them all. I don't think I said by gum. But anyway... Um, the Highlander novelization, movie novelization, is what got me started on this. Now, I've got to say this. At, uh, this is almost a spoiler, but out of all the books, this may be the best one. Okay, definitely the most memorable one. There are some, there are some good TV series books, so I don't know. But this is really good as a movie novelization goes. I really enjoy I was shocked the entire time. Does it repeat stuff from the movie? You bet it does. You bet it does. It does repeat a lot of things. Of course, it follows all the plot points. It has to, right? It's the novelization of the friggin' movie. But at the same time, it explains so much. And this is going to sound super embarrassing, but I don't mind admitting it. I never realized. I had to go back and look at Highlander just real quick to see if they were doing this. I never realized they called him The Kurgan. I just thought the villain's name was Kurgan. And that's what I call it. I didn't know the Kurgan was, you know, like the Highlander. He's from the Highlands of Scotland. The Kurgan is basically the region where he is from and the people of who he descends from. Never knew that. The whole time I'm reading this, I said, why are they calling him the Kurgan? The Kurgan. The Kurgan. I said, why is the, the his first name? 
And then, you know, like I went back to research and I said, oh, they've always called him that. I just never noticed that. Now, it's been a long time since I've seen the movie all the way through. I, I've seen bits and pieces, but I need to, I guess, go back. I watched those movies and the TV series just a couple of years ago, but I've just, I've just never noticed that. You know, when you watch a movie, you're oblivious to something the whole time, and then finally it's revealed, you're like, shut up. Like every Star Wars reference in, in the Indiana Jones films, except for the last one, that was easy. I have a bad feeling about this. Ha, 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 I knew that one. But the other three, no idea. If you don't know what I'm talking about, and the hieroglyphic, while they're getting the Ark of the Covenant, and the hieroglyphics in right there over to the side. They don't even hide it. It's right there in a shot. It's uh, an Egyptian-looking R2-D2 and C-3PO. It's so out of, you know, you can. it's just shining out there. And it's just right there in a steady shot that they had the whole time. It's just over the side. So if you're looking just to the bottom left, I think, of the screen, you will see R2-D2 and C-3PO. I have never. I have watched those Indiana Jones movies hundreds of times. Huh? Raise the Lost Ark. Oh my goodness. I don't even know how many. We used to watch that all the time. Go over to my buddy's house, or I think we had that on VHS. We'd pop it in. we watched that movie a billion times. Never. I'm a huge, and I was a kid too, huge Star Wars fan. Never knew it was there. Now, Easter eggs were something we didn't know about. There wasn't websites to tell you these Easter eggs. And if they were in magazines, I didn't read them. But I thought that, that blew my mind. I was like, shut up. No, it didn't. I went back and I remember I popped in the movie. I was like, there it is. I cannot believe this. And then the same thing for, uh, 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 what's uh, last, not Last Crusade, the one at Temple of Doom. Temple of Doom has a short one. Um, you can hear the guy, and I knew the the villain, or one of the main villains in uh, Last Crusade. Not last, why do I keep saying Last Crusade? And Temple of Doom, excuse me. Temple of Doom is, at the very beginning, the club that uh, Indiana Jones is. They had that big shoot-up, and he runs out, you know, escapes, and Roundhouse drives off. The club's name is Obi-Wan. The, and it's there in highlighted, you know, 50s highlights and everything, and you're like, no way. And it says that. It says that on the thing. And I, it's it's been there clear as day. It's in a good shot. You see them coming out of the Obi-Wan club, and I never knew that. I never looked at it. I never noticed it. We and Last Crusade, not Last Crusade. Why do I keep saying Last Crusade? Temple of Doom. Yeah, Temple of Doom is kind of special to me. For the longest, it was my favorite Indiana Jones movie. Why? Because it was the first PG-13 movie, and because of that, my parents did not want us to see it because we weren't allowed to watch anything. Well, G was the only thing that was approved. Every once in a while, PG was approved. PG-13, get the frick out of here, man. That's not going to be approved. And so PG-13, that my parents didn't want us watching. We could watch Last Crusade and uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, but we never were allowed to watch uh, Temple of Doom. Way too violent and everything. So uh, Temple of Doom was one that escaped us. Well, a long time ago, my grandmother went to Burger King. Burger King, if you order something from Bur- Burger King, you could buy one of the v- Indiana Jones VHSs for 5 bucks, which was a really good deal back in the day because those things sold for about 15 20 bucks, you know, in stores. So she went and she just bought all three VHSs. So she had Last uh, Last Crusade. Why do I keep saying Last Crusade? She had Temple of Doom at her house. And we were just shocked that she had it. And the thing is, my mom had just forgotten why. She just saw Indiana Jones. She didn't know which which movie it was. She said, oh, they're watching Indiana Jones again. She didn't realize we were watching the one they had originally banned. Now, at the same time, I'm sure they didn't care because Last Crusade, I mean, I don't know why I keep doing this, folks. I don't know why. Temple of Doom. Temple of Doom. Uh, Temple of Doom wasn't that bad, and we loved it. We loved Short Round. We thought it was so funny. It felt like a new adventure to us, you know, a new Indiana Jones adventure, and we were so happy. We thought it was so cool, and I'll be honest, him on the with on the bridge, surrounded with the sword, before he cuts it, it's a great cinematic moment. It's, it looks beautiful shot. Um, so, for years, that was uh, Temple of Doom. Aha. Temple of Doom was my absolute favorite movie of the three. I was like, this is great. It's dark. It's gritty. It's got cool scenes. It's the scene where he, that's the scene where he dives underneath the falling rock wall. And right before the rock wall collapses, he reaches his hand in and grabs his hat that had fallen off real quick. Man, we used to, back back in the day when garage doors didn't have the little safety feature, we used to reenact that scene, diving through the garage door, and then at the very last minute, trying to grab our, you'd have to flip your cap off as you as you kind of duck and rolled underneath. And um, 
and then we try to grab our cap real quick before the garage door fell down. This is before the safety features, so it it would snap your arm, you know, and it put some pressure on your arm and put some pressure on you if you got stuck underneath it. But we always had a nephew there to hit the hit the or cousin there, excuse me. I always had a cousin there to hit the button for us to lift it back up. We're the reason why that safety feature got created, probably, folks. But uh, I mean, that was so impactful. You know, the mind chase scene. It was so cool. I mean, you're like, oh man, this is awesome. It has a chase scene in it. So for years, Temple of Doom was my favorite. It's not anymore. I think it reverts back to Raiders of the Lost Ark. And Temple of Doom is the, well, of the main, th- the big three. Of course, Crystal Star is the one that sucks the biggest. But of the main three, that's the one that's lowest. Last Crusade, Star Wars mention here is very brief. But that Easter egg is uh, the villain is also the villain in Empire Strikes Back. A very off, uh, he's uh, General Veers. And it's the same actor, and so I was like, "Oh yeah, that's the guy from you know Empire Strikes Back," because you know that guy. You've saw you saw him at the beginning of Empire Strikes Back, and uh, in it on the on the uh, he's playing the piano right as Indiana Jones comes in. It's the opening bars of the Imperial theme. Dun 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 dun. dun, dun. And it's it's neat. It's, it's a little little something, just you know, not too much that George would sue him. Uh, George wasn't going to sue Spielberg, but uh, oh wait, he couldn't have. It was the same movie. But anyway, they they thought they'd throw that in there, just a little joke. But overall. It, you know, it, it was cute and fun, but I never noticed it before. So I never noticed those before. Those those were big to me. This wasn't an Easter egg, folks. This was just saying the Kurgan, and I just never. It just never hit me. Never hit me that that was what it was. Um, now, in the book, I don't know if they can sense other immortals. They kind of. I don't. I don't. It felt like they couldn't. Um, but. Uh, he uh, he left the rest. Oh no 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 no! He didn't leave because he felt the uh, uh, immortal. He left that wrestling match in the book because he was just bored. He was bored. Of course, they. This is back when wrestling wasn't fake. So he's talking about these. You know, it's it, it's it's the new age gladiator arena is wrestling. You know, slamming them across the mat, being bombastic. You know, to the crowd. You know, but good old and when when wrestling was in its golden age there, right? And. Uh, <clears throat> So, but he left because he was bored. Now, um, there's a, a backstory uh, for Connor and Heather in it. He, Bonnie Heather, you know, is his girl that he loves, which is really good. You got to hear a lot more of that in the uh, in, in the uh, book than you did in the uh, movie, and because they had more time to go into it. But I, I thought it was really good. Um, uh, he, uh, let me see. In the book, also, there's a lot more of Brenda. Brenda's the cop who's kind of, or the investigator who's investigating him. Um, he, inv- he invites himself over to Brenda's house. This is the, this is a date for Connor. And this is the 80s. He goes, you know, let's do, let's do dinner sometime. Okay. He said, your house and you're cooking. You know, you cook me a meal. Yeah, because that's how dates were, right? You, you could go to someone's house and they'd cook for you. If you thought about it, you didn't just go out to eat. And this was still around the 80s. I'm sure people did that. Sure people said, yeah, let's have an evening together. Let's have dinner together. Come over to my house. I'll cook you dinner. You know, and vice versa. I'm sure that happened a lot. Does it happen that much now? It happens a day with families and friends and couples, I'm sure. But uh, I don't know. I just I was like, oh, okay. Those were them days then. Um, now... Connor only, uh, it says Connor's only contacted, uh, to encounter two other immortals, it says in the book, which I guess he encountered the Highlander 3 villain, so I guess they just forgot about him. But of course, that movie hadn't been created yet, so I'm not too much about, about that. And Castiger, Castiger is the, uh, the black guy that he's friends with in the movie, which you don't know much about. There's much more of that relationship revealed in the novel, which I thought was really interesting. Um, another thing, Ra- uh, his relationship with Rachel is discussed in further detail. It's more of a back there is more of a backstory on how they came to be and them growing up, which I found found fascinating. Remember, a young Rachel in what was it, Way of the Sword was interesting. That was interesting. I, I, I like that. But hearing about, you know, how they came together and how their relationship was, you know, today as it was back then, that was really cool. That's the kind of stuff you should read this for. Also, uh, Castiger has, and he's just like a side character. You don't really get to see him that much. He's not really 
you know, uh, spoken about much or mentioned. I mean, he's, he's seen in the movie and then he dies real quick. But here, he gets an entire backstory. I mean, there is tons of stuff in this novel that is not in the movie. And I was loving it. This was the stuff I wanted to read. So I found his background very interesting. And him and Connor and how they encountered each other several times over and, and what their relationship was like. And I was like, this is interesting. And how they became friends and stuff was interesting. Um, there's a, uh, you know, Kurgan. <laughs> Kurgan, of course, is, uh, a, you know, he's having the hookers over, uh, you know, because they have that theme going. He's having hookers in his uh, hotel room. And he looks at one, throws her down, and goes, Poon Poontang time. <laughs> it's just funny reading Poontang time written in a novel. He got a laugh. I don't know. I just like what? <laughs> What's going on? Really funny. Other things. There's one where he has he has this hooker who has a bunch of scars, and she's embarrassed because she has scars. And he's like, "Don't be scared. Don't be embarrassed because of scars." And he reveals, you know, his body, and he's supposedly covered in scars. And he la he laughs at her scars, her hideousness, and she cries. He's like, "No, no, come on, it's okay. Laugh at my scars. Look, look, I'm scarred too. Ha <laughs> ha. We're both messed up. Ha ha ha." And it's almost like, wait, this is not Kurgan. Why was why is Kurgan being kind to this woman? You know, hey, don't cry. Hey, I have scars too. Look, you can laugh at me. Come on, let's laugh. Let's laugh it to, together at us. I think this is more of, and as I thought about it more, I was like, no, this is just Kurgan just enjoying life, right? To the twisted, to the twisted parts of life, you know, because he's kind of crazy. So that's a crazy laugh. He doesn't he doesn't pity that girl at all. Yeah, he laughed at her. Sure, she cried. And he's like, hey, 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 don't cry. I mean, I think it was more like a crazy... I think if you were seeing that... Because I tried to play this in my mind. Like, well, how would this go into the movie? And think about it, like, hey, hey, hey. We gotta, let's be crazy. You and me, we're crazy tonight. You know, because he is kind of crazy in the movie, too. And so that makes a little bit more sense to me. Um, there's a few other things in this uh, novelization I have to talk about. One of the uh, uh, cops who's on the case is taking a bite of his cherry cheese sandwich. Yeah, cherries and cheese on a sandwich. Now, I, I didn't try this out because I don't have cherries. I love cherries. In fact, it, it's been a while since I bought cherries, and I'm, now that I'm thinking about this, I need to go buy some cherries. Um, because I used to, my mom would buy them every once in a while, and they were so good. Um, I think she bought them when she was making desserts, but she lets eat the remaining cherries in the jar. Um, but I was thinking, cherry cheese sandwich. And I want to say, did my mom ever make something like that? Because it sounds like something my mom would have made us. And I meant to ask my mom, cherry cheese sandwich with mayonnaise. I don't know. But it feels like I may have had something like this as a kid. Was this a thing in the 80s? A cherry cheese sandwich? It sounds weird and also sounds pretty disgusting too. But it's mentioned in this book. Also, this book was written another time. And the F word. Oh, not the F word. You're not the four letter F word you're thinking. <laughs> the derogatory name for a homosexual is mentioned in this flown around all the time by Connor himself. Um, <clears throat> so I was like, ah, ah, the days before PC. So if you're easily offended, you may not want to read this book. <laughs> That's not in the whole novel, but it's in that one scene where they're interrogating him and everything. Um, so it's like, oh, oh, they're going to get... It's funny how that kind of word kind of shocks you. Where back in the day, in the 80s, it didn't shock anyone as they were reading it. Um, but anyway, I just, that's something I noted, notated here. Um, uh, he... Let's see. Some other things. Trying to read my notes here. Um, Oh, well, I don't know what this means now. I can't, I'm trying to understand some of my comments here. I should have made this more thorough here. I don't know what this means. He had more knowledge of the church. I don't know what that means. Anyway. Um, oh, there's more stuff going on in the church. There's a bigger dialogue. I know what this means. There's a bigger dialogue going on in the church between him, uh, the Kurgan, and Connor. You know, about his wife and everything. And find out Ramirez is his... You know, he killed his. It wasn't Ramirez's woman. His. I think that was in the movie too. But there was a, just some extra stuff. It felt like that, the uh, book scene. And I, I did check this someone else. He said, "Yeah, there's a lot more dialogue there, um, than in the church scene too," uh, which I thought was neat. Um, 
And it the book does say there aren't that many mortals in existence today because this is the time of the quickening. Um, and there's way bigger fight between Castiger and Kurgan in this. Uh, Castiger and Kurgan uh, in the movie it's kind of just one off. He kills him. That's it. But in the book they kind of go into more detail. And it's really good. You find Kasker didn't just lay, roll over for Kurgan. I mean, Kasker's very talented. There's a reason he's made it this far in life. And uh, he just didn't have it. Uh, the Kurgan is really powerful and really, really hard to beat. Um, so, um, they, um, I think, uh, Kurgan, afterwards, after Kurgan fights Kasker, he gets into a bar fight too. Um, and then uh, other things they explain. There is a great. Uh, there's cop cop backstories. Some of the cops get their own backstories too. Uh, Brenda, her scene where Kurgan captures her and takes drives around town and scares her and everything is that is way more than just them you know joyriding around. Um, so that was really that was really neat. Um, there's way more dialogue between Connor and Rachel, which I really enjoyed. Uh, Brenda's backstory, her, the, the, the cop, she goes, there's a, there's a whole chapter on her where she goes down to Florida to go see her dad, who's a retired cop, you know, saying, hey, there's a guy investigating him. I think I'm falling in love with him. What should I do, dad? You know, and stuff like that. So it, the book focuses a lot around Brenda a lot, which is really cool because the movie didn't. And I thought that was really neat. Um, but one of the coolest things and this is a thing that really got me interested and this is why I, I do want to recommend you read this novel I do think it's a fantastic novel but it ex it goes into Kurgan's history the Kurgan's history ah oh, it's great like how he became immortal uh, an Arab who taught him and everything and uh, you know how Kurgan developed and what he felt about his new power uh, as an immortal that is the stuff I wanted to read about. Even if the book just was a, just a rehash over everything from the movie, which a lot of it is, but it's uh, if, if this is the one thing they had in there, it would have been worth it to me. Now, I'll be honest. The whole thing overall is well worth your time. This is a book. This is a book you need to get. And I don't... I don't think I, I don't care about any spoilers here because if you've seen the movie, duh, you know how it's going to turn out here. But... Uh, it's more than just a, a, a count by count recalling a retelling of the movie. It's way more than that. And it is, I mean, like my friend said, like Bruce has told me, it was really impressive. So um, the High, Highlander, the novelization, is a pretty good one. And if, if you, that's the only one you want to get, I think I'm fine with that too. You know, maybe you weren't a big fan of the TV show. I can't imagine you not being. But, uh, the T in the TV show books, I'll get I'll get into those upcoming. But as the uh, as the as the Highlander novelization goes, it's good. You can still get this for cheap. It's not hard to find. I found it very simple. I mean, if it's if it's seven ten bucks, it's like I said, you may have to get it overseas. May not any be in the copies in the U.S. Maybe there is. You know, like I said, at the time I was looking for it, there's only copies overseas. It took forever to get to me, but it's definitely worth the wait. It's definitely good. I mean, it goes into so much. Back, uh, Castiger's backstory is a, is a highlight, too. I really like how they went into his character a little bit more. I like how they went into Rachel's character more. Um, uh, you know, her relationship with Connor, that's a good thing. That's a solid thing in the book. And then, of course, uh, going into Brenda the Cop, giving her more of a character than the movie had time to allow. I mean, how? That's another thing. How many of these were deleted scenes? If you and that he just wrote on, because if you remember, a lot of times when writing these novelizations, they'd have to see a rough cut of the film and then get to writing it. So it, it kind of got me thinking. I don't know if there are deleted scenes from the movie that were included in the book, but it could have been, because a lot of this stuff seems like oh. Why didn't they put this in the book? I mean, why didn't they put this in the movie? Um, and maybe they did, and maybe it just got cut, and the author kept it in. But that's another reason why you get these, because I think it's—I think it was very cool. I like when they deep dive, and I don't blame them. I don't think the movie was, you know, uh, flawed for not giving Kurgan's background. No, we we got it. Kurgan's evil. We got to move on. We don't have time to do his background. We we focus on our main hero. But, and it's a movie. You have to get it done within X amount of time. You can't have a, well, I mean, some people can have a three-hour movie or ten-hour movie, but 
uh, you know, most movies run generally 90 minutes to two hours. So they're trying to get everything to fit within the novelization um, within the two hour slot. I got it. But the book doesn't have those restraints, and then they can go and give those characters more depth, and that's what they did. So Highlander the novelization, highly recommended. All right, folks, that is all the time I have for now. But I'll see you next time on more Princes of the Universe.